Welcome to the ISF podcast from the Information Security Forum, featuring timely conversations, practical insights, and resources for global cybersecurity professionals. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert. This week, we bring you our annual Emerging Threats episode with ISF CEO Steve Durbin, giving us insight into the emerging threats we expect to see in 2022. Here's Steve. Hello, everybody. Thanks very much for joining me for this ISF annual threat update. Now, normally, and I said this last year, and I was hoping I wasn't going to have to say it again, but normally I'd be doing this from the Harvard Club in New York. But pandemics being what they are, here I am again in a studio. Hopefully it will be different next year. So what am I going to be covering here in about the next 20 minutes or so? Well, I'm going to really set some context for my thinking around the threats for 2022. Be very brief on that. And then I'm going to go through four of what I think are going to be the threats for us to watch out for in 2022. I'm then going to go into some of the mitigations that we can uh, adopt from a security standpoint and then move after that into the questions that I was just talking about. So what have we been seeing over the last 12, 18 months? Well, the world has changed again. The pandemic has had a significant impact on everything that we do. And for me, that's really, I think, created what I would refer to as now being the new normal for cybersecurity. What do I mean by that? Well, everything has moved much more into a digital environment. We had to do that from a business standpoint, where a lot of us were moved to working from home, of course. But that hybrid working, too, has changed, because now, from a security standpoint anyway, we don't have the same level of control that we might have had over people who were working in our offices, for instance. We've got pretty much an unprecedented number of devices and connections that are operating, coming into our corporate networks, accessing our corporate data. We've also expanded the number of third parties that we're working with. Some of them have fallen by the wayside, maybe because they weren't able to survive the pandemic, or maybe because we've actually shifted some of our providers during that time. And we've had to adapt and learn how to conduct security audits remotely when we'd rather do them in person, of course. And then we've got new technology that's coming on top of all of this. We've moved aggressively into cloud environments. We're seeing artificial intelligence, algorithms around that. ISF members listening to this, you'll know that we're producing our Threat Horizon report in the not too distant future. We talk a little bit in that about some of the algorithmic threats around artificial intelligence. And then we've got 5G that's really going to accelerate the way in which we access data, and we'll bring some fairly significant changes with it. But all of that, speed of change, different ways of working, they're all going to become the norm from a cybersecurity standpoint going forward. And I think we've set ourselves up in the main pretty well to use some of the new metrics that we've got, some of the new monitoring systems to really equip ourselves and our companies with a much better level of insight into how we manage and monitor security across what will be ever expanding and extended networks. So if that's where we're coming from, what really then are the threats that we're going to be facing? The first one I want to pull out is cyber attacks. Cyber attacks, yes, they've been with us for quite some while, but I think over the last 12, maybe 18 months, things have changed a little bit in this. I think everybody is very much more aware now of the impact of a cyber attack. If you take the Colonial Pipeline, for instance, that moved the impact of a cyber attack very, very clearly into the public domain. The inability to put fuel in your car if you're in the United States really brought home, I think, what a cyber attack can actually do. If we look at JBS, what happened there back in uh, June this year, the world's largest meat processing firm forced to shut down facilities in the United States, in Canada, Australia, because of a ransomware attack affecting the supply chain in terms of getting meat products out to the public. So cyber attacks have moved from being something that perhaps happens to somebody else, is predominantly about data and an intangible, to something that is very much more real, affects people, and that has raised the level of awareness. And that can only be a good thing. The downside, though, is that cyber criminals are becoming even better, showing an even higher level of operational capability when it comes to launching attacks. And so we have to be ever vigilant. Ransomware is not going to go away. 
Ransomware, I think the threat has been around for a number of years, is going to remain a top concern in 2022 to individuals, to the public, to private sector. And we're probably not doing a good enough job yet in terms of anticipating some of the challenges in that space, in terms of helping law enforcement track down some of those cybercrime gangs, and really, I think, keeping an eye on all aspects of our extended ecosystem. So cyber attacks, clearly the first threat for 2022. The second one is technology, technology on the edge. Edge computing is increasingly an attractive architectural choice for many, many organizations. The move to cloud, the move to pushing processing of data out to where it's required, brings a degree of agility with it, brings a higher degree of effectiveness from a corporate standpoint. But that adoption of edge computing can also create a number of different points of failure across the organization. And so we're going to have to rethink some of the way in which we provide security confidence across our extended architectures. Zero trust is one of the ways that we're talking about doing that. And if you are an ISF member, you'll know that Paul Holland, a little while back, produced what I think was an excellent briefing paper that really sort of takes some of the mythology away from what zero trust actually is. It is a strategic direction that you have to take. It isn't a simple case of buying another piece of technology and plugging it into our extended networks. It requires us to rethink our whole approach to endpoint security, to access management, to the management of data. And that's something that we've been talking about at the ISF for many years now. Some of you will remember us talking about our crown jewels, how to protect them, and various projects around that that we've been running. But if we also add into edge computing this emergence of 5G, that's going to change things significantly too, because we can suddenly step up velocity the volume of data that's being shared. And that will bring challenges that we really need to face up to from a security standpoint, because we simply aren't operating quickly enough in terms of identifying some of these challenges. So technology on the edge is really something that we're going to need to focus on, I think, in 2022. The third threat, the never normal. What's that all about? Well, this is about organizations finding themselves in this new world of constant change having to revisit some of our established technologies, maybe because of threat two that I was just talking about. Maybe having to revisit some of our overall policies, processes that perhaps are no longer fit for purpose. And it's this constantly shifting landscape that gives rise to new challenges. I think gone are the days when we could plan on having some time to actually think about how we're going to implement our governance and our processes across that overall security landscape. We're still going to need to do it, of course, but we're going to have to do it very much more quickly. And what's going to differentiate between the winners and losers here are those that can really harness the power of their security departments to assist in developing some of those business strategies, helping with the way in which new products are being developed, looking at how we're expanding into new geographies, providing insight and assistance when we're looking at mergers or acquisitions or demergers even. So building very much more security by design into our processes, that for me is the big differentiator. But we also can't lose sight of the fact that we're going to be returning to some of the ways that we used to do business. So we're going to be traveling more, we're going to be meeting people more, we're going to be using airplanes, trains, boats. We need to pay attention too to the way in which we're protecting our data as it is in transit, where we as people are making use of it. So security departments really need to be taking a very much more holistic view on the way in which the entire corporate real estate manages and uses information. And that requires them to be very much more agile, perhaps, than they have been up until now. And that's why it's there as a third threat for 22. And then finally, it's threat number four, digital division. Now, some of you may be looking at this and thinking, where's he going with this? Digital division, why is that something we need to be concerned with? Well, the digital divide is this differential ability to access data and digital technologies. But if we think about that in a bit more detail, what does that actually mean? Well, we talk a lot in security about skill shortage. A digital divide fuels that shortage because people aren't getting access to the systems that they need in order to learn, in order to become more effective. If you're a multinational and you're looking at how you can expand geographically, you need to take into account 
the infrastructure that you're moving into, the skill sets that you're going to be able to access as you move into new geographies. But also this rapidly accelerating push that I was just talking about, perhaps around edge computing, perhaps around 5G, perhaps just around simple internet usage, is going to impact the way in which we move data, the way in which we manage our supply chains. And so we're no longer going to be able to ignore the fact that different parts of the world have a different stage of maturity when it comes to digital assets and digital product access. And that is hugely important from the security standpoint, because no longer are we going to be able to have one vanilla flavored approach to managing security across all of our corporate assets around the world. We're going to have to adapt. We're going to have to change. We're going to have to take into account the capabilities, the infrastructure in these different areas, very much more, I think, than we've had to do in the past. And there is also another piece to this, which is around a much more geopolitical and political aspect, which is the control and the flow of information. So again, how do we ensure that our reputation as an organization is being protected in different geographies if we have a situation where perhaps governments are shutting down access, are controlling the flow of information and general public discourse, perhaps through social media. It impacts the way in which we reach out, not just to our employees, but also to our customer base and our regulators. So very much broader based, I think, discussion needed around the impact of digital division as we move forward from a corporate standpoint in 2022. So those are the principal threats that I wanted to talk about in this particular session. What does all of that mean? Well, for me, it means that security has to increasingly adopt what I keep terming the business view. As organizations adjust to a new operating environment, the role of the security professional, the role of the security leader, really, I think, is raised quite significantly from what we've seen in the past. We're looking at people who are not just very solid in their ability to understand some of the security aspects that we've been talking about, but also who have much softer skills, the ability to understand how they can protect assets that include people, that include premises, that include technology, right the way across the business. People who can actually convey the messages that business leaders, the board, really need to understand, perhaps around the, I don't know, stability of supply chain and business partnerships. What do we need to be doing in certain areas? That requires people to also understand the importance of the financial health of the organization and the role that security has to play in that. So I'm talking here about expanding quite significantly the overall remit of security. And I think that's really important for us to understand really important for us to address, particularly in the light of some of the threats that I've been talking about, because it means that we have to embark on an education process, not just with our employees, but also with our boards, potentially with our stakeholders all around the world. So if that's the scenario that I'm depicting, what then does good look like? Well, let's start at the top. So addressing cyber risk needs a formal, and indeed I would say a frequent place on the agenda for board meetings. Boards have got better at understanding the role that cyber risk plays in overall business management, but there is still work to do in that. And I think one of the things we cannot ignore is that not every board, not every organization really understands the role that cyber plays in an organization. We have to continue with that process of education. Things will go wrong. We need to have very well rehearsed, top-down cyber incident responses. At the ISF, we've been running a large number of these exercises just over the last 18 months and specifically over the last couple of months. And we'll continue to do that into the first quarter of 2022, mainly to try to help organizations to reassess where they're at, perhaps to revisit some of their cyber incident responses, update them in the light of the way the pandemic has affected their business. We need to really clearly define a company's risk tolerance with regard to cyber loss events. What does that mean? I mean, it's about having the conversation about what is important when it comes to managing risk. Should we be sending board papers to non-executive directors using Hotmail, for instance? Should we be looking at our insurance to see whether or not we can be covered 
for ransomware. Those are both opposite ends of the spectrum, some might say, in terms of the discussions that need to take place. But they're all related to risk tolerance. And I'm absolutely fine with both of those, provided the conversation has taken place. And we've arrived at a situation where the risk aspect has been discussed and accepted. And I think finally, we need to really understand and continually work on these critical links that I've been talking about between the business, strategy, and security. And we need to be really resourcing appropriately our organizations to deal with what is an ever emerging, increasingly complex risk landscape. So I've talked about how we came to where we are. I've talked about the key threats that I see for 2022. I've talked about some of the ways in which we need to change. So let me leave you with just a few brief points. We need to focus very much more in terms of the way in which we can really add value from a security standpoint to the business. That means that resilience has to be the number one priority. We need to continually identify and reprioritize critical assets that perhaps have changed in value. Nothing remains the same, nothing is static. What we have to do is provide that insight so that in the event of there being an attack, the organization can get back up and running as quickly as possible. Risk management takes on a much broader role, I think, across the enterprise. I very deliberately here on the slide talked about risk management, governance and compliance. Now, those of you who are in very highly regulated industries will perhaps reverse that order and talk about compliance first. But I'd encourage you to think about just one point, and that is that good compliance does not necessarily make good security. Risk management and governance effectively done does enhance security and in a lot of instances also help with the achievement of strong compliance. We're going to continue to expand our use of technology, expand our use of services, but we need to keep those risks within acceptable limits. Stress test our data centers. I mentioned very much earlier we're all moving to the cloud. What does that actually mean from a security standpoint? Are we going public? Are we going private? Have we really assessed the level of security that we've got with our cloud providers? Are we prepared to pay for it if necessary? I've touched on as well the role that the supply chain has to play. That's going to continue to change. We need to communicate, I think regularly, I think effectively with our key suppliers. We need to share, we need to collaborate, review some of the exposures that we have to threats and simply ask some of our supply chain partners how they are also responding to those. Perhaps sharing some of our operating procedures. So a much more collaborative, joined up approach to managing the supply chain, because actually it's our data that is flowing across those supply chains. And then finally, and we shouldn't forget this one, it is about the people. The world of work has changed very significantly. Our policies and our procedures obviously need to reflect that. But that doesn't give us really what we need to be doing in order to be effective in the way that we work with people. We need to be paying particular attention to cyber fatigue, to mental health. One of the things that the pandemic has done, one of the things that homeworking has done, is not just remove people from their colleagues, but increase the amount of screen time and dependence on technology infrastructure. And with that comes, yes, an increase in, for some people anyway, productivity, but it has also increased the potential for malware to be dropped completely unwittingly onto some of our employees who will click because it's the end of the day. Some of them may be suffering too in terms of this cyber fatigue because they're still staying glued to the screen. So we need to have much broader people policies in place that allow us to understand the role that technology is playing in our organization, the role that people have in terms of accessing that technology and to be ever vigilant that we're not overstressing people that actually we can't perhaps immediately see. Because the workforce isn't the weakest link in the security chain, it's actually the strongest. Thanks for joining us for this presentation on Emerging Threats 2022. Next week when we return, we'll pick up with Steve's Q&A on Emerging Threats. Then we'll take a holiday break for a few weeks before we come back in January when we begin a new season and new year of valuable interviews.
In the meantime, if there's a topic or a question that you'd like us to cover in a future episode, let us know at securityforum.org, which is also where you can find the ISF catalog of past video and podcast episodes, as well as research, practical tools, and guidance related to discussions like today's. You can find us on LinkedIn by searching CEO Steve Durbin or Security Forum. You can follow our audio feed wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And if you like the ISF podcast, we would really appreciate it if you'd write a short review. The ISF podcast is produced by TalkBox and Tavia Gilbert with music by Alexander Filipiak. Associate producer Katie Flood. Mix and master by Brian Barney. Thanks for listening.